today. Um, I'd like to welcome our speaker, uh, Deepak Palak Shapa, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine uh, here at Wake Forest. Uh, Dr. Palak Shapa's research focus is on improving health outcomes of um, low income and vulnerable populations. And his primary interest is on uh, food insecurity and other social determinants of health. Uh, he completed his internship and residency at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Internal Medicine and Pediatrics and um, got his medical degree from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and also has a Master's of Science in Health Policy Research from the University of Pennsylvania. So on behalf of the Department of Internal Medicine, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Chapa. Great, thanks so much for that, uh, for that great introduction and for inviting me to give uh, Grand Rounds today. Um, and at, there we go. Um, as Adam said, I'm an assistant professor in general internal medicine, um, and my research focuses on improving the health outcomes of low income and vulnerable po populations. I specifically focus on understanding how health systems can address the social determinants of health. So today I'm going to talk to you about one aspect of our research agenda, which is food insecurity, and the what, why, and how health systems can address food insecurity in clinical care settings. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. So I was going to start today with a, a patient I saw, actually as a second year resident, as a second year resident um, in my continuity clinic at a federally qualified health center outside of Boston. Mrs. D was a 63 year old female with past medical history significant for hyperlipidemia and left sided paralysis secondary to a traumatic brain injury in her, in her 30s. This is my third visit with her. And I really distinctly remember the visit because it was right around Christmas and we had one of those food drive boxes out in the waiting rooms where patients or staff could drop off cans of food to be donated to like a local food pantry in the area. Now about nine months before our visit, Mrs. D had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And over that previous nine months, she'd been in the ED multiple times for episodes of hypoglycemia. And on my two previous visits, we'd had to reduce her insulin 70-30 because she'd had some episodes of symptomatic hypoglycemia with blood sugars in the 40s. We had just sort of started wrapping up the visit. I decreased her insulin again. Um, and I was getting up to leave the room, and Mrs. D asked if she could have one of the cans of foods from the food drive box. So I was sort of confused. I wasn't quite sure I understood what, what she was asking. I wasn't sure she was saying, should I, could she donate? But then she proceeded to tell me that she had actually didn't have any food in the household for her and her husband for the holidays. And that over the last nine months, she'd been struggling with having enough food at home. She'd frequently skip meals, or her and her husband would try to split meals to try to make it last, um, all because she was worried about making sure she could afford her medications, and she wanted to take her insulin as prescribed. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what my face looked like, but this is how I felt. I mean, this is my third visit with Mrs. D. She'd been in the ED multiple times for hypoglycemia, and nowhere along the line had any of us thought to ask if she actually had food in her house. Kind of what's more is I had no idea how to respond, and I think I was sitting there thinking, like, how can I get out of this room and talk to somebody about what to do? Um, but I didn't know what to tell her about where to go to get help, what, what, what help I could even offer her. Now, clearly this patient experience with Mrs. D kind of shaped my career and research goals, but I imagine I'm not the only person in the room that's had a patient where they struggled to have enough food at home, they would frequently miss appointments because they couldn't afford transportation, or they couldn't refill their medications because they had to pay their rent. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the social factors that affect health, so their social determinants of health paying specific, specific uh, attention to food insecurity and food insecurity's effect on health and health outcomes. And then I'm going to end talking about some of the emerging data about addressing food insecurity in clinical care settings and some of our work to develop a digital health tool to address food insecurity in ambulatory care settings. So I imagine that people have, many people have seen a slide like this or seen this slide specifically, but it compares how much the U.S. spends on health care compared to other OECD countries and health outcomes. So for the bar graph, just to orient you, this doesn't work. Well, you see that? All right, well, anyways, so 
for the left-sided y-axis is for the bar graph, which looks at the percentage of the gross domestic product that countries spend on health care. And here on the right-sided y-axis is life expectancy in years for the line graph. And as you can see, despite spending more on health care, almost 18% of the GDP on health care, the U.S. fares far worse on life expectancy compared to other similar countries. Now, I included life expectancy on this figure, but I think you could pick most any other health indicators like mortality from coronary heart disease, infant mortality, and find similar results that despite spending more on health care than other similar countries, the U.S. tends to rank nearer at the bottom for most health indicators. People may be less familiar with this figure, which includes the percent that each country spends on social services in the green bars here. So I think the big takeaways from this graph is that, one, the U.S. spends far less on social services compared to health care and spends less on social services compared to other countries. Now, for this study, they define social spending as the benefits or financial contributions targeted at households or individuals to provide support during circumstances of, that adversely affect welfare. So essentially, how much does a country spend on social services for people that live in poverty? So despite how much the U.S. spends on health care and the advances in medical care over the last several decades, Many have sort of wondered and argued that one of the reasons why the U.S. does not fare as well on health outcomes to other countries is because of how much they spend on social services. Now, this concept that social or economic factors affect health is certainly not a new concept or new idea. Thomas McCune was a British physician and epidemiologist um, and is considered by some as the founder of social medicine. He actually published a series of articles as well as a book called The Role of Medicine, Dream, Mirage, or Nemesis in 1976 in which he argued that the massive improvements in population health between the mid-19th mid century and the mid-20th century had little to do with health care. He evaluated death records from 1850 to 1970 and he argued that the greatest decrease in mortality actually occurred before many of the improvements we have in health care and he theorized that the advances in life expectancy and population health over this time were, were, the, result of, were the result of rising living, living standards, particularly better nutrition. Now, one of the first and most famous groups of studies to show the detrimental effects of social factors on health were the Whitehall studies in the 1960s and 70s. So the researchers conducted a longitudinal cohort study of over 17,000 British civil servants who lived in the Whitehall area of London. In the first Whitehall study, they followed the, British, the civil servants for eight years and found that lower employment status, so the people that were the manual skilled laborers or the messengers, were more likely to have a higher prevalence of hypertension, increased glucose levels, obesity, and increased smoking rates. Now, even when they controlled for these factors, though, the individuals in the lowest employment grade had 3.6 times the odds of mortality from coronary heart disease compared to the administrators or the people in the highest employment grade. Now, in the figures that they included in their study, you can see that over time, this difference in mortality actually increased as opposed to narrowed. Now, the term, the determinants of health, or the social determinants of health, were actually first used by Thomas McCune in 1972, but it wasn't until 2005 when the WHO had its first commission on the social determinants of health. The CDC subsequently defined the social determinants of health as the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play, and affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. And since the original Whitehall studies about five decades ago, research and studies have continued to show that the, the effects of social, economic, and environmental factors on health. And while we often think of health as defined by health care or medical care, it's estimated that only about 10% of health is actually determined by health care. Numerous studies have found that, or suggest that health behaviors such as diet, exercise, and smoking are the 
are the most important determinants of premature death. There's also been this growing recognition that social factors as the social determinants of health affect individuals' ability to engage in these health behaviors. So for example, it's hard to eat healthy when you don't have access to a grocery store or be active if you don't have sidewalks or a place to be active in. Now, also as noted in the Whitehall studies, these social factors can potentially have direct negative effects on health and well-being and not just shape sort of behaviors. Now, one, of the, one important social determinant of health that's prevalent in the U.S. is the lack of consistent access of food to food or food insecurity. Now, there's a lot of attention to the issues of food insecurity and hunger um, in the U.S. during President Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. In his address to Congress in 1966, he stated, hunger poisons the mind. It saps the body. It destroys hope. It is the natural enemy of every man on earth. And this war on poverty actually led to many of the government programs we use today to try to address food insecurity, and which I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. It wasn't until 1995, though, that the USDA convened a working group to define, what food, to define food insecurity and hunger. And food insecurity is defined as the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, or the ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways and remains a major public health problem in the U.S. Now, hunger was defined as a potential consequence of food insecurity, but they actually defined those two separately. And as part of this 1995 working group, the USDA developed the 18-item food security scale, which is used to measure food insecurity in the U.S. And in 2007, 11.8% of U.S. households, or over 40 million Americans, suffered from food insecurity. Now, with the development of the food security scale in 1995, the USDA has measured food insecurity in the U.S. yearly as part of the U.S. Census Bureau, Bureau's current population survey. Households are categorized as either having high food security, low food security, or very low food security. And low and very low food security are considered, uh, considered a household is considered to be food insecure. And then very low food security is the most severe form of food insecurity. Now, as you can see, since 1995, there was a large jump. Sorry, thought I could use that pointer. Uh, there's a large jump in food insecurity from 2007 to 2008 due to the Great Recession. Now, this peaked in 2011 when almost 15% of U.S. households were food insecure. And at least over the last sort of two to three years, there's been a slow decline in the percentage of households in the U.S. that are food insecure because of improvements in the economy. But as you can see, food insecurity still remains higher than pre-recession pre levels. Food insecurity is a particularly important issue here locally as North Carolina has the eighth highest rate of food insecurity in the country. Over 14% of households in North Carolina are, are estimated to be food insecure. And Winston-Salem in particular has the 14th highest rate of food hardship in the country. So just to orient you to the, to the map here, so this is Forsyth County. This green line, if you can see it, it's kind of light on here, sorry, um, is Winston-Salem. And the darker orange areas are the areas with the highest rates of food insecurity. And we are located right here. So almost in the heart of this area of food insecurity. And for those people that practice the downtown health plaza, a little bit further east, they're sort of, it's sort of right directly into the middle of the of food insecurity. Now for those of you that don't practice here at the medical center or in downtown, food insecurity is certainly not just an, an urban or city issue. In general, actually in the US, rural areas tend to have the highest rates of food insecurity. Now this map is similar to the one I just showed. It just looks at the different rates of food insecurity in each state. But it also includes in this dotted line, if you can hopefully see that, um, the states that have a larger proportion of their population that live in, er in rural areas. So the big takeaway point from this is the states that tend to have a larger pro proportion of their population that live in a rural area tend to be the states that have the highest rates of food insecurity like Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina. 
Now, while we often think of food insecurity and poverty only being sort of rural and urban issues, poverty in the suburbs has actually grown over the last 15 years. Unfortunately, we don't have measurements or estimates of food insecurity down to the level of the suburbs. And while poverty and food insecurity aren't necessarily synonymous, poverty does increase your risk of having food insecurity. And in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, poverty in the suburbs has grown by 66%, more than double the rate in cities. And when we published this paper, we only had data to 2012, but this trend at least continued to 2015, which is when we have the most recent estimates. So, now with this growing recognition of the prevalence of food insecurity in the U.S., a clearly defined definition of what food insecurity is and a scale to actually measure food insecurity, there's been an exponential growth in research looking at the effects of food insecurity on health. Now in this study, the, the authors just simply looked at the number of publications published in PubMed um, that looked at food insecurity and health. And as you can clearly see, in 2000 there was probably less than 10 papers maybe, whereas in 2016 there was almost 400. Now, through this growing literature, we have found that food insecurity has been associated with numerous negative health outcomes, including diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary heart disease, obesity in certain populations, mental health problems, as well as increased acute care use. We actually recently completed a study, a cross-sectional analysis of the 2007 to 2014 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey specifically looking at how food insecurity may affect individuals who are obese. So we, we looked at the question of, if an individual was obese and lived in a food insecure household, were they more likely to have a comorbid condition compared to someone who's obese and living in a food secure household? So NHANES is a series of large cross-sectional surveys conducted by the National Center for Health Statistics and uses a multi-stage probability sampling to identify, so results are representative of the U.S. population. And randomly selected participants complete an in-home interview and travel to a mobile, mobile examination center for physical examination and laboratory collection. And so we included all participants who were obese with a BMI greater than or equal to 30 and greater than 20 years of age in the 2007 to 2014 NHANES surveys. And we excluded those who were pregnant or missing food insecurity data. And of the over 9,000 participants included, 15.6% were food insecure. And we also found that individuals who were obese and living in a food insecure household were more likely to have higher odds of having cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and asthma compared to individuals who were obese and living in a food secure household. Now, this is particularly the case for those that lived in very low food secure households, so the most severe form of food insecurity. So now, the exact mechanism by which food insecurity leads to worse health outcomes or chronic health conditions is really kind of unclear. Um, there are many theories or potential pathways that have been hypothesized. Some of them, or one of the first pathways, and maybe the most intuitive, is called the diet or nutritional pathway. So because of limited economic resources, individuals who live in food insecure, food insecure households you are more likely to have sort of lower diet quality or consume higher energy, high energy, low cost, high energy dense or low cost foods. And several of the studies that I cited, cited below specifically have shown that individuals who live in food insecure households are less likely to eat fruits and vegetables, have decreased fiber intake, and increased consumption of high fat, high sugar foods and drinks. Now this lower overall diet quality could potentially lead to chronic conditions like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. It could also lead to increased weight gain and obesity. Now one of the other things that's been found is that individuals in food insecure households resort to consumption cycling. So consumption cycling is defined as eating more when food is available to offset times when food is scarce. And this consumption cycling has been shown to, to lead to increased weight gain and, and potentially obesity. The second pathway is often called the stress or mental health pathway. Because of concerns about having enough food, food insecurity leads to increased stress, 
feelings of hopelessness, as well as depression and anxiety. And all of these, uh, and all of these, which have all been linked to either obesity or some of these chronic conditions. And in animal models, food scarcity has been associated with increased cortisol levels, which potentially lead to increased glucose and insulin levels and possibly diabetes. Now, depression alone has independently been associated with a progression of atherosclerosis as well as elevated cardiovascular risk. Now, the third pathway is often considered the health or healthcare behaviors pathway. So, this may be, may, may be a little less intuitive, but individuals in food insecure households often face what are called competing demands or priorities. So, for example, they often have to choose between spending their money on food or medication. So, like my patient, Mrs. D, who was choosing to spend her money on her insulin as opposed to food for the household. Now, these competing priorities often lead to issues of medication adherence or delays in seeking preventative care, leading to progression or worsening of chronic conditions. Now, I sort of drew all these figures or lines kind of linearly, but as you can imagine, the relationships are probably much more complex and, and interrelated. I didn't even include on here that actually worsening chronic health conditions could potentially feed back and lead to worse food insecurity. So as you develop worsening chronic conditions, you have more doctor's appointments, get hospitalized more, miss more work, have higher health care bills, which it could all feed back and potentially worsen the household food insecurity. So now all this relationship is very complex and maybe a little depressing. Um, all hope is not lost. There are per several federal, state, and local programs specifically designed to try to address household food insecurity. Now the first is the nutrition assistance of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is formerly called the Food Stamp Program. SNAP is a federal food assistance program for low-income individuals, and it's the largest program in the domestic hunger safety net, um, serving over 40 million Americans each year. Eligibility slightly varies by state, but generally based on gross income of less than 130% federal poverty level, which is the cutoff here in North Carolina. SNAP's not only been shown to reduce poverty and food insecurity, but there was a recent paper actually showing that SNAP enrollment actually reduced healthcare expenditures. The second program is the Special, special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC. The federal government provides states with these block grants for WIC to provide supplemental foods, nutrition education, as well as referrals to social service agencies for women who are pregnant or up to one year postpartum and have an income below 180%, 85% of the federal poverty level. WIC's been shown to improve birth outcomes as well as to improve the dietary intake of both pregnant and postpartum women. And the third program is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, what we often think of as the food banks, food pantries, and states often provide funds to different food banks to provide food to food pantries, soup kitchens, um, for emergency food assistance for patients or for individuals. Now, despite the availability of these programs and, their, and some of their proven benefits, a lot of people who are eligible don't actually participate. So up to a third of individuals who are eligible for SNAP or WIC don't actually participate. Now, there's a number of potential reasons why, but the primary barriers reported are one, the stigma, so the stigma of having to receive government benefits or having to go apply for them. But there's also logistic barriers, so a lot of people have difficulty completing the application or just confused about whether they're eligible or not. So now, historically, historically addressing food insecurity or trying to connect patients to these different federal or state benefits has really been the focus of public health and policy communities. But because of the prevalence and the potential for poor health outcomes, numerous national, national health care organizations are, have become interested in health systems beginning to screen and address food insecurity and other social determinants of health as part of, as part of routine clinical care. The National Academy of Medicine specifically recommends different social and behavioral domains be captured into the electronic health record in order to improve patient care and reduce health disparities. Addressing food, 
addressing food insecurity and other social determinants of health has also become increasingly important financially for hospitals, clinics, and health systems. So as health systems have increasingly moved away from fee-for-service to more value-based payment models, there's been an increasing interest in, and attention focused on addressing patients' unmet social needs in clinical care settings in order to mitigate risk and improve population health. I think many people were probably here for Secretary Mandy Cohen's Grand Rounds, in which she discussed some of the changes to Medicaid managed care, including the plans for, for Health and Human Services to address social determinants of health. And they actually re recently released their standardized social determinants of health questionnaire, which specifically includes questions about food insecurity. They have plans to require that all Medicaid managed care payers screen potential patients for these social determinants of health. And I think their hope is that they feed this information back to providers. So again, going back to this theme that what is old is new again, um, addressing food insecurity in, in clinical care settings is certainly not a new concept. Um, Dr. Jack Geiger, one of the original architects of the community health center model, routinely addressed food insecurity in, in the Mississippi Delta Health Center he started in the 1960s. He would frequently write prescriptions for patients to receive food at local grocery stores and then would change the, and then would charge the cost of the food to the, the clinic's pharmacy budget. And when one state official challenged him on this practice, he famously said, the last time I looked in my medical textbook, the most effective therapy for malnutrition is food. Now, if we are gonna start moving towards models where we identify and address food insecurity and other social determinants of health, I think there's, there's a couple key questions that people want to know and which I was interested in knowing in, in trying to make, to try to uh, implement these strategies. The first is how can we effectively and efficiently identify which patients are food insecure? And then once we do identify those patients, what can we actually do in a clinical care setting to address <laughs> food insecurity? So I mentioned at the beginning that the USDA developed the, the 18 item food security scale which is, is considered the gold standard for measuring food insecurity in the U.S. But I imagine that if you tried to implement an 18-item questionnaire in a busy clinical setting, it probably wouldn't work very well. Patients probably wouldn't fill it out or it would, it would potentially delay the appointments. So in this systematic review, the authors actually screened over 1,300 titles and reviewed 190, pa 190 papers to identify potential screens for identifying food insecurity in healthcare settings. They actually identified three brief one or two item validated questionnaires with high sensitivity and specificity for identifying food insecurity. So the questionnaire with the highest sensitivity and which was most commonly used in the studies is what's been termed the hunger vital sign. So it consists of two questions which are in the last 12 months we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. In the last 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last, and we didn't have money to get more. So an affirmative response to either question is considered a positive screen. And compared to the USDA food security scale, this two items questionnaire has been shown to have 97% sensitivity and 83% specificity. This two item questionnaire is actually the, the food insecurity screen that's been included in North Carolina Health and Human Services Social Determinants of Health Screening Tool. Now, if we're able to sort of efficiently and effectively identify which patients are food insecure in clinical settings, what can we really do about it? So in this sub-systematic review actually published last year, the authors looked specifically at interventions designed to address patients' social and economic needs in a healthcare setting. They screened over 5,000, almost 5,000 titles between, published between 2000 and 2017 and identified 67 studies of 37 unique programs. Now, a couple things I think that are notable from this systematic review is there was a wide variability in the studies included um, in terms of both the intervention used in the population or social determinants of health targeted, as well as the study design and the quality of the studies included. Most of the intervention used, that most of the interventions used though use what are termed as clinic community linkages. So essentially what a clinic community linkage is is a, is a partnership between a healthcare setting or a clinic 
and an organization in the community that is focused on addressing a particular need. So a perfect example is a clinic that screens patients for food insecurity and then is partnered with a local food pantry who they can directly refer to patients to. Now these linkages can potentially be live outside of the healthcare setting. So again, you could provide a referral or send a message directly to a food pantry. Or some of these interventions where they actually embedded the clinical community linkage within the clinic setting. So uh, a member of that community organization or an advocate from them would be in the clinic and be available to meet with patients who are identified as having an unmet social need. Now, the majority of these studies that use these clinic community linkages primarily focused on process measures. So did patients receive resources? And, and the vast majority of them found certainly that by developing these clinical community resources, it improved the access and availability of resources for patients. So more patients who were food insecure ended up signing up for SNAP benefits. And I think one of the, the biggest limitation and what the authors even talk about in the, in the paper is that very few of these studies have actually examined how does this affect health outcomes. So it's clear that some of these clin clinical community linkages will improve the resources patients could potentially receive, but it's a little bit unclear do these actually improve health outcomes. So this study published in Health Affairs in 2015 is actually one of the few studies to try to evaluate the impact of these clinical community linkages on health. So in this study, the authors conducted a pilot study at three sites in three different states. The three sites were, were particularly a clinic that were partnered with a specific food pantry. And patients with diabetes were screened in the clinic for food insecurity, and those who were identified as being food insecure were eligibly referred to the study to the study at the food pantry. So the researchers enrolled 768 food insecure diabetic patients. And the intervention was a medically tailored food box that participants would receive at the food pantry. And this medically tailored food box was designed by a registered dietitian or diabetes educator specific for patients with diabetes. And participants could come every one to two weeks to pick up a new food box. They also provided different diabetes supplies as well as education support at the actual food pantry. Their primary outcome was change in hemoglobin A1C over the six month study period. Um, they also looked at some secondary outcomes including, including dietary changes and self-reported medication adherence. And over the six month study period, they found a small but significant decrease in hemoglobin A1C. Um, the hemoglobin A1C decreased from 8.11 down to 7.96. They also, again, small, found a small but significant increase in the fruits and vegetables participants ate from 2.8 to 3.1 servings per day, and an improvement in self-reported medication adherence. And I think a couple things to note, they actually only had a 58% 58 retention rate, which I thought was pretty good given the population they were trying to reach and that it was focusing on a on a food insecure, a low income population. But there's certainly several limitations to think about when you think about how this, this study, what the study means, um, particularly around the, the potential loss to follow up, as well as the pre post study design of the study. But I do think the study does, my big takeaway, and I, what I think the study shows, is the feasibility of using these clinical community linkages to address food insecurity in a clinical care setting and as well as maybe showing that there may be improvement in health outcomes. Now, more recently, a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine last year evaluated clinical community linkage in which the, the linkage was actually embedded within the clinic or the practice setting. So the researchers in this study conducted a retrospective cohort study using electronic health record data from three academic internal medicine clinics who had implemented the Health Leads program. Now, Health Leads is a national program that consists of screening patients in clinic settings for different unmet social needs. So, for example, food insecurity, lack of transportation, any health insurance needs. And patients who screen positive are eligible to meet with a Health Leads advocate, who's usually a student volunteer or a volunteer for some, from some, some other organization. And that advocate, can provide information about resources in the community, as well as assist patients 
with obtaining different resources the patient is potentially eligible for. So their primary out the researchers looked at the change in blood pressure and change in blood pressure LDL and hemoglobin A1C over time for those who screen positive for an unmet social need compared to those who screen negative. Now, it should be a couple things to note about the, the study design. So to be included in one of these analyses, you had to have a diagnosis that would require you to want to reduce one of these, these outcomes. So, for example, you had to have the diagnosis of hypertension to be included in the blood pressure analyses. Or you had to have the diagnosis of diabetes to be included in the hemoglobin A1C analyses. Now, they included, the, author, the researchers included several different covariates, including age, gender, the Carlson comorbidity index, and for their unadjusted analyses, they used a difference in difference approach to evaluate the change in outcomes over time between the treatment and control groups. Now, people may be a little less familiar with diff and diff, but difference in differences is actually an econometric technique to try to, that attempts to mimic an experimental design with observational data by examining the differential effect of a treatment on a treatment group compared to a control group over time. So this is kind of a, rough schematic I threw together, so. Um, but essentially for this study, the control group is considered those patients who screen negative for an unmet social need. And the treatment group would be those who screen positive for unmet social need, with the treatment being the, the health lead advocate who would assist them in trying to get resources. And then so they look at basically the change in one of these outcomes over time, comparing the control and the treatment group. They also, for adjusted models, use, a, use linear mixed effect models to look at change, change in each of these outcomes. So of the 5,125 participants included, 1,774, or almost 35% screened positive for one unmet social need. Now, a couple things to note. Actually, a third of patients who screened positive for one of these unmet social needs actually dec declined meeting with the health leads advocate. But of those that did, almost 70% actually obtained a new resource or a new benefit. And maybe didn't come out as great as I was hoping, but this here on this figure over here, it looks at the unadjusted difference in difference models for blood pressure, LDL, and hemoglobin A1C. And what you can hopefully kind of see, and at least in the in the adjusted models, you can see that they found this health leads model had a small but significant decrease in, in systolic and diastolic breast blood pressure as well as LDL. Uh, but they did not actually find, interestingly enough, they didn't find a difference in hemoglobin A1C. I think what these two studies, one being they're, one, they're two of the few studies that have actually looked at how these clinical community linkages affect health outcomes, I think they also highlight the effect of how addressing food insecurity or other social determinants of health in clinical settings can improve the resources patients receive. And there may or may not be a potential effect on health outcomes in the future. But at least these sort of initial studies show some small improvement. Now, despite there being sort of these brief validated questionnaires and this growing or emerging research about addressing food insecurity in clinical care settings, as you can imagine, very few practices, health settings, or clinics actually address food insecurity and other social determinants of health routinely. The primary barriers to sort of more fully implementing or disseminating these kind of interventions have been reported as lack of time, a limited understanding of how to address the patient's unmet social need, or knowing what even organizations are available to try to connect with or, or create a partnership with, and also a lack of tools or personnel to integrate food insecurity screening or other social determinants of health screening into like clinical workflow. Now, one method to try to overcome these barriers are digital or mobile health tools. And in the next sort of, or the last sort of five minutes or so, um, I was gonna talk about some of our work to develop a digital health tool to address food insecurity and other social determinants of health in clinical care settings. So through the support of the department and the Center for Healthcare Innovation, we've had, we have developed and we'll be testing the feasibility and acceptability of a tablet-based food insecurity screener that identifies patients with unmet social needs at the initial time of care delivery, integrates this information into the electronic health record, 
and then automatically provides patients with resources and automatically alerts the clinician of patients who have screened positive for food insecurity. So soon, we're going to be starting to screen patients at the Downtown Health Plaza who present for a routine medical visit. The patient will complete the tablet-based screen in the waiting room, which will not only include questions about food insecurity, but also questions about transportation, as well as ho ho housing instability. And for those patients that are identified as having one of these unmet social needs, an automatic alert will notify the clinician who will be seeing the patient as well as the clinic's patient navigator, who will be available to meet with the patient to discuss resources in the community. The resources from an electronic health record-based community resource guide actually developed by one of our residents, Andrew Benefield, will also be automatically included within the after-visit summary or discharge instructions for the patients. We'll be following up all patients by phone about one month later to see if they utilize the resources and if the process improves the that improve patients' access to these different resources in the community. And at the end of the study, we're, we're planning on surveying all clinicians and staff of the DHP to understand the acceptability of this tool, of the tool, and the effect of the process on clinic workflow. Now, this just gives you an example of what one of the questions is, one of the questions are. So this is actually the first question that I talked about with that hunger vital sign. But it will actually automatically display in English and Spanish based on the preferred language of each person within wake one. And then the results of the screen for everyone will be automatically and sort of seamlessly integrated within the flow sheets of each patient's EHR chart. And then this gives you an example of some of the resources that are automatically included in the after visit summary. Again, this came from Andrew Benefield's uh, Community Resource Guide in which anybody that screens positive for food insecurity resources will automatically be auto-populated within the after-visit summary to be provided to the patient. And some of the resources included include the local to the, to, the, to the SNAP office, as well as local food pantries in that area. So the successful completion of this study will not only show us the feasibility and acceptability of using a digital health tool to identify and screen patients for food insecurity in a, in a clinical care setting, but also, I think, open up for several different avenues of further investigation, as well as potentially changes to clinical care models. So one example is at the patient provider level. So I mentioned North Carolina Health and Human Services has announced plans to try to address social determinants of health. And as part of that, they've announced plans to develop what they call NC Care 360, which is a resource-based platform where both payers and providers can potentially refer patients to different community resources within the state of North Carolina and have that information fed back to make sure that patients are actually receive those resources or actually go to those visits. With this resource platform and when it's actually developed, we could potentially connect our tablet-based screening tool with the platform in order to identify patients with these unmet social needs at the point of care, at the point of care and then hopefully seamlessly refer them to these different resources through the platform to try to reduce the barriers to actually accessing these resources. Another example is at the population level. So as we begin to collect more and more information about social determinants of health or unmet social needs within the electronic health record, you can begin to see how health systems could help sort of survey or look at sort of population or community health at a broader level. So in this example, actually, we took electronic health record data from nine primary care practices in Philadelphia that had been routinely screening for food insecurity. And we combined it with publicly available data from the Department of health, Public Health about resources, about different food resources. And we used geospatial tools to try to map where patients who are food insecure were located within the city and the surrounding, within Philadelphia and the surrounding counties and where potential resources in those areas are located. This could potentially identify gaps where patients with a high, where there's a high percentage of food insecurity is and where there's not really much in the terms of the local food pantries available to them. But it could also potentially show, provide more granular understanding of how these different um, social factors change over time. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have estimates of food insecurity at the level of the suburbs because they're just not great ways of measuring that. 
And so as more and more health systems begin to try to do this, it could be a potential way of, of looking at population surveillance at sort of a community-wide level. So in the last sort of 45 minutes or so, um, <laughs> I, hope <laughs> that, uh, I hope you took away that we have a better, took away a better understanding of what food insecurity is and why it's a major public health problem in the U.S. And also some about the emerging data about how health systems can begin to identify and address food insecurity in clinical care settings. Now, I'll be the first to sort of note or admit that a lot of this research is still very much in its infancy. Um, I don't know how many people have noticed that many of the studies that I referenced were literally published within the last five years. So I think this is clearly a very growing research area and clearly something I'm very interested in, in doing. So, but my hope with this lineup research is that when a patient such as Mrs. D comes to your clinic or comes to my practice and we have the tool to identify her being food insecure and the ability to effectively address that food insecurity or other unmet food need in order to improve health, their health and their health outcomes. So there are a lot of people to thank um, and then have been involved in this work and to thank for their help and I'd be happy to take any questions. So, so have we had any discussions about incorporating, incorporating this into hospitalization? It seems like a screen when people are admitted, we don't have the time pressures, we have time to then plan for discharge, and it seems like that would potentially positively re impact readmissions, so there would be a net gain to the system. Uh, and we're pretty social work light here, mm -hmm. uh, so we may have to invest in a few people to help do that, but have there been any discussions of incorporating this into the hospitalizations? So first of all, I would love to, and happy to have more and more of those discussions. Um, sorry, is this working? Uh, there have been, a, I had a couple of talks with like social work and trying to figure out how that might be possible. I think one is the personnel um, and two, the other issue being that we take so many patients from different places that you get into this issue of like, where do you, where do you actually refer them to? So like most of the resource guide that we have is specific for Forsyth County and some of the surrounding counties. But if you have somebody that's admitted from far away, you may not know what those resources are. But I would, I think it'd be great. I think it's a perfect idea to try to incorporate these um, into the, into screening patients in the hospital. And there have been a couple, there's not, there's not, I, I'll be the first to admit, there's not a lot of data in sort of more inpatient settings about screening. Uh, there is one group out of Cincinnati that is starting to do that, where particularly for patients with asthma and screening patients for different housing issues. And so, Clearly, if people have mold or other things that are leading to different asthma exacerbations, they'll screen, they've been screening patients for housing issues and then working with the city to try to clean up that mold in order to reduce, in order to reduce ED and hospitalization visits. So, but yeah, so the short answer is yes, I would love to try to do this in the inpatient setting, and, but there's just not many that have done it. So I think it, it again opens it up to a lot of different lines of research. And if, so, uh, Th thanks for a great talk and uh, just great review of the literature for what's a rapidly developing field. Um, you know, I'm struck that y you make a solid case that in the United States we spend much less on social spending than other countries, and so it seems we rely on a lot of community groups, charity groups, private groups, and a lot of the work is um, focused on how do we connect patients to this very fragmented system and overcome those barriers. But has anybody looked to see if the resources are sufficient to meet the need? So if we were 100% successful, would we solve the problem? Or is part of the problem also that we just don't have enough resources, even when you pull together all the charitable groups in town? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. So, <laughs> I mean, I think SNAP is, so we'll take SNAP as the big example. Uh, so on average, people, on average, a household that receives SNAP, SNAP gets about $1.35 per meal. So clearly that's not a whole lot in terms of the benefit if you actually receive those benefits. But on the other, on the other hand, a lot of people that are food insecure also have incomes above 
130% of the federal poverty level, so they don't actually even qualify for those benefits. Um, so I didn't, I didn't, I ended up taking it out of the talk for time, but we did do a study uh, looking specifically at suburban food insecurity in which we, we worked with a partner that helped, helped patients, we'd screen patients for food insecurity in the clinic setting and, and patients that were identified as being food insecure could be referred to our partner who helped them apply for SNAP benefits. And in those suburb, suburban areas, actually one of the 121 people that were identified as being food insecure actually received new benefits. And the primary, now a lot of people were just like, I've already tried, I, don't, I know I don't qualify, I don't wanna bother. But then also the people that they did try with just weren't eligible. So, so yes, you, you make an excellent point that there's definitely issues with not just what are the resources out there, but also are those resources enough for the need, and then who's eligible to receive those resources, and what, and what really constitutes need. Deepak, that, that was really wonderful. Um, just sort of to uh, follow up a little bit on um, Bayard's question and, and David's question. Um, so if um, health systems were incentivized um, to improve health, how different would they look, um, you know, from what they look like today, you know, from a, a structural perspective? Wow, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great question. Um, what is sort of the grand vision of what these look could look like? Um, I think my hope and what I, I think you could sort of see happening is is that a lot of the focus around improving health will potentially live outside of the healthcare setting and outside of those sort of 15 minute sort of outpatient visits. And the hospital is truly potentially a place where um, it's for more than very much more the acute issues. But that hopefully we get to a point where we don't allow those progressions. I mean, there's always going to be those issues that come up. People are going to develop sepsis. People are going to need hospitals. People are going to need ICUs. But some of these conditions that could have been prevented, like my patient that had these multiple ED visits for hypoglycemia, would hopefully never have happened. Um, and then when you, I think, start to think about these changes in, value, in payment models, in, in value-based payment, hospitals and health systems will be incentivized to try to make that ha happen because then the risk falls on them. So if you know that you're going to lose money if the same person that has issues with not, not being able to afford their medications or can't actually get to visits because of transportation so keeps calling the ambulance, then, then hospitals are clearly going to, hospitals and health systems are clearly going to say, like, well, we don't really have much of a choice if we want to stay solvent. Is that that's kind of a that's kind of my dodgy way of answering your question. <laughs> to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> Gary being the sublime and I being the ridiculous. <laughs> We are being implored every day in this season of joy and generosity to contribute to the backpacks mm. filled with food for the, the children of, of Winston Salem. Is there any idea, or is it just a totally a ridiculous uh, <laughs> cop out? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> that is an excellent question. Um, so I will. So I'll start by saying no one has ever really studied the backpack program. So. It is entirely unclear what it actually does. I understand the kind of motivation behind it. So, for food, so, food, so households with children are more likely to be food insecure, especially households with young children, particularly because, I mean, older children can potentially work and contribute to the household income, but younger children in particular. And when, and one of the major um, programs to fight or child food insecurity and, house, and, and to help with children that are food insecure is the, the school lunch and breakfast program. So when you lose that, either on the weekend or in the summer, then that potentially is a, a time when households are more likely to be food insecure. So I, I get the concept of it. I don't know if it actually works. <laughs> and I'd, I, uh, I have my doubts. 
<laughs> but, but I mean, it could. I could be surprised. But like, I'm not sure how providing one meal in a backpack for one child actually helps the household as a whole. I also wonder, I mean, people living in, in poverty are probably sort of the most resourceful people because they have to be. And so my, my sense is maybe we might be missing something there that like people have potentially figured out what to do on these times of like the weekends and things like that. Um, so one of the studies we were doing now, we have a, a CTSI pilot grant um, with the Program and Community Engagement in which we're really trying to look specifically at this issue of food insecurity on the weekends. And we've, we only, we're still pretty early in it, but we've only done about 10 interviews so far. And one of the interesting things that have come out is that people aren't necessarily, you know, there's a lot of focus on like the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, but people are like, oh no, Sundays were great. Our whole family comes together, like aunts, uncles, grandparents all come together and have this big meal. We're not worried about Sunday. Now, Saturday, that's a different story, but at least on Sundays, and again, it's for this neighborhood. We're just using Boston Thurman neighborhood. So it could vary based on different neighborhoods and communities. But um, I think, again, I understand the motivation behind the backpack program. I, I just not sure it may be hitting, quite hitting the point, but I could be proven wrong. I mean, it's fine. My question really dealt with uh, food insecurity over time. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that as uh, People who live in the suburbs and rural areas were often self-sufficient, had gardens where they grew their own food, they could supplement uh, things that they bought in the store. And over time, uh, many people lost that skill. And many people moved to cities where they don't have the land or the areas to grow things. Or, but community gardens have grown up as well. And do we know anything about the impact of lack of skills and growing our own food and canning our own food and food insecurity and the impact of uh, no, Yeah, so, so the, the short answer is no. Um, I, I think that people are hoping that developing these community gardens can potentially address these issues, but there's just so little data about whether they're, they're effective or not, it's hard to know. Um, there is so something not exactly because, like I said, there's not there's actually just really not that many much research about community gardens. There's a little bit more research about these community supported out agriculture, so the CSA programs where they provide boxes of food. And so it's a, a little there's again there's only we're talking about like a handful of studies with some showing some potential improvement, but the major thing being that a lot of the people that you would hope utilize these programs aren't the ones that actually utilize them. So the people that are utilizing the CSA program aren't the low-income people that are food insecure. It tends to be more middle, upper middle income, dual career households that may not actually need, it's, not, it's, it's addressing a different need. And I think the similar thing with the community gardens is the people that may be actually going there and growing may not be the same as um, who you're trying to technically reach. Um, it, it seems like a lot of these studies are like small sites, you know, up to, up to several states, but that seems to be like a huge bar between. Um, how much of an impact do you see from like industry regulation, like New York putting a, a soda tax? Like it seems like a lot more effective way to reach a population. Um, but like what, what burden does industry like have? Mm -hmm. Just trying to use our fingers to pull like uh, the, the leaf. So, yeah. No, uh, excellent question. So, um, the two things. So, first, you're right that so far a lot of the studies have been fairly small, one city, a couple, a few sites. Um, there is a couple of studies coming out. Um, one that came out. Now it's been a year or two. Um, in pediatric clinics, though, which is why I didn't end up including it, where they looked at eight sites and they did a cluster randomized trial of this. There's also CMS ha is, has just started what they're calling the Accountable Health Communities model, in which they have selected 30 to 31 different sites from across the country to, and, and to try to test to see if these kind of programs where they screen patients for unmet social needs and refer them actually does improve not only the resources they receive, but they're also looking at healthcare utilization. 
and, and I think some in terms of health care outcomes, but again, they're five-year studies, so I think they're limiting to how much they're trying to look at as, as far as outcomes. To your second point, yes, clearly policies have been shown to have a, an enormous impact and, and potentially a larger impact than some of the interventions we use with soda taxes, with smoking bans. Um, and I do think industries are growingly interested in these kind of issues, uh, particularly industries that have large, have to pay for a lar large contingency employees' health insurance. Uh, so companies like Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway, they, they merged and they are starting up their own sort of ideas about how to address the terms of health. Walmart is a perfect example of a company that is particularly interested in food insecurity because they're such a large distributor of food in the country and because a lot because they have to pay for health insurance for their pay, for their employees so there are a lot of sort of private companies trying to do things in this space um, and so I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens um, but again I think it also comes down to like at, at a policy level you there are there do have to be some policy changes like there's there's only so much any of us or any company can do, but I think people are trying to figure that out. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Please don't forget to fill out surveys, evaluations. They're very helpful. They're sitting on the seat. Hey, Steve. Hey. Oh. oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Gary. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Down, but I suspect how the economy recovered. Totally the economy. 